Championship Series. The scene has shifted to the magnificent Sky Dome in Toronto, and it's on the line for the Blue Jays, who are down two games to nothing to the Oakland A's. This is baseball's most modern facility, yet it provides the setting for the kind of rivalry as old as the game itself, with the A's and the Blue Jays taking pot shots at each other these past couple of days. Hi, everybody. I'm Marv Albert. Welcome to the start of NBC's baseball coverage. Bob Costas, who has been a busy man the past 24 hours, along with Tony Kubek, will bring you all the action later on. Some lineup changes for Toronto. Junior Felix replaces Lee Mazzilli. George Bell becomes the DH Manny Lee at second for Nelson Liriano. Tonight's pitchers. For Oakland, Storm Davis, 19-7 and seven this season despite that high ERA, but the A's usually score when Davis uh, pitches. They've been getting him runs. For Toronto, Jimmy Key, he's been bothered by a tired arm. He's had a disappointing season, 13-14 and 14 and a 3.88 ERA. And suddenly, things are heating up. There has been bad blood the last couple of days between the Toronto Blue Jays and uh, the Oakland A's. Ricky Henderson, the focus of some of the anger on the part of Toronto players in the midst of stealing four bases in game two on Wednesday to make it six stolen bases in two games. He came in standing up on one of his steals, which was not appreciated by catcher Ernie Witt. I think the biggest thing was the way that he, he pulled up short of the bag and just kind of tiptoed around it and touched the back side of it, like just laughing at me. And, you know, it's, it's fine. I mean, I didn't have a chance of throwing him out anyways, and that's why I didn't throw the ball. But the fact that he stopped and he tiptoed around the back, that, that upset me. But, uh, again, that's his style of play, and, and, you know, I'm not the first guy to call him a hot dog, and I probably won't be the last guy. Uh, the comments that made by Honor Ritt, I really didn't understand what he mean by, you know, I was trying to show him up. I think I got a tremendous jump on that on that pitch, and I looked back, and he wasn't throwing the ball, so I just raised up and slowed down to get in the second base, so I really didn't understand what he was talking about. So with his comment, based on I think he's really just trying to boost up the team, focus on the guy that is, is probably hurting him, and I've been doing it on the base back. Now, in Oakland, fans of yours refer to you as a, a stylist or a flashy player. Others say you're a hot dog in the strongest sense of the word. <laughs> Which is it? Is it hot dog or stylist? I don't really uh, know what hot dog really means for as a, as a ball player is going out doing his job. Stylist, I have my own style for as the way I play the game and what makes me go out and get my best. Well, if you're a fan of the Oakland A's, uh, Ricky Henderson can affectionately be labeled as a hot dog. One other moment in game two that bothered uh, the Blue Jays. They were annoyed that Dave Parker took his time in circling the bases after hitting this home run. The Blue Jays felt that he was showing them up. Parker also stood and admired his work, which upset Toronto third baseman Kelly Gruber. I don't particularly care for the hot dog type. Um, it kind of makes it kind of makes me want to get vengeance, you know, in some way, some fashion, form of fashion, or whatever. I say that because when I see it happening, it burns me up inside. I think it's a ridiculous remark, anyway. I've been doing this game 16 years. It's the same trot I've always given. When we come back, I'll be talking about all that international goodwill between the Toronto Blue Jays and uh, the Oakland A's. So back with our American League playoff analyst, manager of the Texas Rangers, Bobby Valentine. NBC Sports presents the American League Championship Series, an inside look. Brought to you by Honda, who invites you to test drive the new Accord. You have to drive it to believe it. And by Lennox Heating and Air Conditioning. Quality proven over time since 1895. Must be a Lennox. Toronto, where the Blue Jays are 10 out of 10 when the retractable roof is closed. And the roof is closed tonight. And we are joined by our American League playoff analyst, the manager of the Texas Rangers, Bobby Valentine. And Bobby, what about this feud that has uh, taken place here uh, between the Toronto Blue Jays and the uh, Oakland A's? Is it sour grapes on the part of the Blue Jays making those strong statements, or are they correct? A lot of strong statements indeed, and I feel it is sour grapes. Uh, they're a very frustrated team right now. Oakland's coming in here. They're stealing bases. They're stealing the show. 
Oakland is doing what they want to do. Toronto is not. So they're frustrated and, and saying things maybe they shouldn't. All right, if you are Cito Gaston, are you annoyed about players lashing out? Well, I talked with Cito in Oakland, and Cito said his team was very relaxed. Everything was going fine. It didn't go too fine. They lost two games in a row there. Maybe now they're not so relaxed. Maybe they're a little more emotional. Maybe they're fired up. And maybe this is exactly what they need to beat this fine Oakland team. All right, how do you react to hot dogging? Let's take a look at the play that the Blue Jays were particularly upset about with Ricky Henderson coming in, uh, standing up on the steal. Well, he stole the base very easily, and you react to the pitchers not holding him on. Uh, they have to do a better job at that. I think Toronto's a little worried, though. Maybe there won't be enough of mustard to go around when uh, Mosby and, and Fernandez and Bell get their act together. Do you look for retaliation tonight? And are you surprised there was uh, no retaliation either at Henderson or uh, one of the other members of the A's the other day? Well, I think it's more like uh, they'll, they'll hot dog back. I think if George Bell hits one over the fence, he'll stand at home plate. If Tony Fernandez makes a great play, he'll do his thing, and that's the way they'll get back at the Oakland A's. Well, Jimmy Key is the Toronto pitcher this evening, and among the positives with Key, he's very good at holding men on base. Uh, will this play into tonight's game? I think it definitely will. He can break the momentum of a, of a base runner. His move to home looks like a move to first. I think McGriff will be the guy who will have to throw the guy out at second base rather than the catcher because he can pick a guy off first. Uh, what do the Blue Jays have to do to win tonight? Well, I think it's very simple. Uh, McGriff and Bell, they're, they're three for 16. They have uh, two RBIs between them. They have to get their act together. They have to hit. That's why they're here, and uh, they have to continue to do it. Yes, McGriff particularly has been silent since uh, early September. Do you see the Surrey shifting back to Oakland? Well, the only series that will be in Oakland is the World Series if the Blue Jays do not win tonight. Tonight's a must win for the Jays. All right, Bobby going way out on the limb. If the Blue Jays don't win tonight, it's, uh, it'll be over, you're saying, tomorrow. All right, Bobby Valentine, our American League playoff analyst, will be back here in Toronto in a moment. Back at the Toronto Sky Dome, they are standing and cheering as the Toronto Blue Jays are being introduced. The manager of the Jays, Cito Gaston, receiving an ovation. Field. Mosby. And now the starters being Batting introduced. Batting second by in left field, number Murray three, Smokey Wilson. Batting third, the first baseman, number 19, Fred McGriff. Batting fourth, the designated hitter, number 11, George Bell. Batting fifth, the shortstop, number one, Tony Fernandez. Batting sixth, the catcher, number 12, Ernie Witts. Batting seventh, the third baseman, number 17, Kelly Gruber. Batting eighth, the second baseman, number four, Manny Lee. Batting ninth, in right field, number 54, Junior Felix. Pitching for the Blue Jays and warming up in the left field bullpen, number 22, Jimmy Key. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1989 American East Division Champions, your Toronto Blue Jays. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the colors for tonight's game are the United States Marine Corps of Buffalo, New York, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police of Toronto. Will you please rise and join Canadian recording artist and the star of the Royal Alex presentation of Les Miserables, Michael Burgess, in the singing of the national anthems. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were 
so gallantly swimming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love, in all our sons command, with glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free from far and wide oh canada we stand on guard for thee god keep our land glorious and free Stand on guard for thee, O oh, Canada. We stand on guard for thee. Well, this crowd is ready for game three and we'll have it with Bob and Tony in a moment I'm Marv Albert we'll be back after this from NBC News at times he seemed like Superman and in fact, he is Oakland's Man of Steel. Despite home runs by three teammates, pitching victories by Stewart and Moore, and dazzling defense from Tony Phillips, Ricky Henderson has been the dominant presence in the first two games of this 1989 playoff series. Eyes darting, spikes flashing, body hurtling. He's been everywhere, and always at the right time. igniting the A's and infuriating the J's. A sorry story for Toronto fans through the first two games, but now the scene shifts north of the border. Will Henderson remain a towering presence at the Sky Dome, or can the Blue Jays right themselves in front of a home crowd? The answers are just around the corner. Game three is next. Welcomes you to the Sky Dome in Toronto for Game 3 of the American League Championship Series. The defending league champion Oakland Athletics against the Toronto Blue Jays. The Toronto Blue Jays moved into their new home, the Sky Dome, on June 5th, and even though they missed the first two months in this facility, they still drew 3.3 million, an American League record. They might break the Major League record next year. They are wild about their Jays, and they should be roaring here tonight. Hi, everybody. Bob Costas, along with Tony Kubek. The question is, can Jimmy Key and company give them something to cheer about? Key, 13 and 14, but a winner of six of his last seven decisions against Storm Davis, 19 and 7 for Oakland. When you're in sports, Bob, you should never 
put too much emphasis on one opposition player. There has been a lot of that with Ricky Henderson, and he well deserves it over the first two games. I'm afraid all the words back and forth has made the Blue Jays lose their focus. If Jimmy Keyville can come back, which he's capable of, giving them six or seven good innings, if they can do what they did best at the end, finish it up with Hankey, if they can hold a lead, they had the lead both times in Oakland. They're at home. There really is no pressure. They weren't supposed to win this thing to start with. Now they're deep, deep in the hole. They need two out of three here at least. Even if they get that, don't know if they can win the whole thing. Quickly, does Henderson or somebody else have to go down tonight? Well, I don't think so. You should never say that in the papers. When you do, you have no, you cannot throw at a guy because the umpires read the papers too. We'll be back to take a look at those lineups and have the first pitch from the Sky Dome. Game three coming up. Game three of the American League Championship Series is brought to you by your Toyota dealer. Whatever car or truck you choose, you'll love the quality. Who could ask for anything more? By Coors, brewery fresh, pure and natural. It's a true American original. By Anderson Windows, come home to quality, come home to Anderson. And by State Farm Insurance, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. We're back live and they jumped the gun on us here. And Ricky Henderson stepped into the batter's box. A ball and a strike to him. On base, seven of nine plate appearances. Two hits, four walks, and hit by a pitch. Jimmy Key at times can be the hardest thrower on this starting staff, with the exception of Todd Stottlemyre. If he's got the fastball, he can get inside and sink the ball away. And he'll use a lot of backdoor breaking balls, curve balls on these right-hand hitters with power. Three balls and a strike. You know, people are making a lot of Ricky Anderson's speed as we look at Jimmy Key's record. He had a big inning build up in April and May, and he had about a dozen starts where he just didn't have as good velocity. They disabled him, strained rotator cuff. He came back fairly strong in August, but inconsistent. The count is full to Ricky. I think that's what people forget. They say, well, gee, if we can hold Ricky Henderson down, and you probably will off first base for the left-handed pitcher. But Ricky Henderson becomes a little bit better hitter against the left-hander, too. So you've got to worry about his extra base power now. He's stolen six. The record for steals in any postseason series, playoffs or World Series, is seven. Lou Brock did it in two different World Series for the Cardinals. Henderson has six in two games. The 3 2 pitch. Bad news early for Toronto. It's the fifth time they've walked him. Not only that, Jimmy Key rarely walks opposition hitters. He's been fantastic, his ratio of strikeouts to walk. Ricky Henderson has stolen 22 bases against left handed pitching, been caught just two times. He will pick his spots, be more selective. But he's still high percentage. Cito Gaston, what do we call a pitch out? Now they have a hold up from something. Cito Gaston not on the phone to his bullpen. Dale Ford, the home plate umpire, going over to the dugout. I don't know if it's the banners in center field. It might be. There's some white banners with red lettering hanging down just above the fence. I don't know if that means they're going to try and clear them, which would be in a right-handed hitter's view, I would think. While we have a chance, a quick look around the Sky Dome. It's 328 down each line, 375 into the gaps, 400 to straightaway center field. The scoreboard, way out in center, is the largest in the world, 33 feet high, 135 feet wide, surrounded by what will eventually be a 70-room luxury hotel. It won't be open for a couple of months yet. There's a Hard Rock Cafe here. About 20 restaurants that are beyond your usual ballpark concession stands. A movie theater, a health club, a miniature golf course. And while we get a chance, a look at Tony La Russa's lineup. Henderson at the top, of course, and he began the game with a walk. Carney Lansford to follow. He's at the plate now. Jose Canseco hitting third. Mark McGuire in the cleanup spot. Dave Henderson has had three hits, two for extra bases in center field. Steinbach to catch. Parker the DH hitting seventh against the left-hander. Phillips the switch hitting second baseman and Gallego back at short. 
He played game one, Weiss game two in Oakland. Key works to the plate. Those of you who saw our last Saturday game of the week, Jimmy Key started. He toys with the man on first base with the pitcher's rubber. He will have his knee cross over the pitcher's rubber, but not his foot. And that's one of the moves he used, and you'll see it from that angle. If the foot goes past the pitcher's rubber, the center field side, he's got to come home. And he'll give you a lot of different looks with his head, with his knee. It's a paralyzing kind of move for a runner at first because it gives the illusion that the foot has crossed over, when in fact only the knee has, which allows him to make a move to first. Ricky back. With 77 steals this year, Henderson was caught 14 times, six for six in the playoffs. That time he had Ricky going back to first base. But with a smart base stealer like Ricky, the decoy might be a little shift of the way toward first base and then guess on first move and go. He has seen about every trick any pitchers have. Anybody who stole as many as he has, over 800, has stolen off some pretty good pitchers. Pop toward the seats beyond first base. McGriff racing over with Manny Lee, and it's a few rows in. And Bob, not quite as much foul territory, I don't believe, as Oakland, but there's considerably more here than there was at Exhibition Stadium. Where there might be some troubles are balls hit in the corners. We saw that on that last Saturday game, where fans could reach out either over the railing, touch a fair ball. We've talked about putting plexiglass there, but haven't gotten it done. The Blue Jays have won 20 of their last 26 in this park. They've never lost 10 straight with the roof closed. Ricky's not going, and Lansford fouls it back. A lot of fastballs to Carney Lansford. Lansford was telling us yesterday when the Oakland Athletics worked out, not the Blue Jays. They had a day off to regroup. But he said before Ricky came to us at first and Conseco got back, I was getting a lot of walks. He said, but with Ricky there, a lot of fastballs. They're not walking me. With Conseco behind me, I'm getting a lot of good fastballs to hit. He sets the 2-2 pitch. Full count. He is one of the game's finest control artists in the regular season. He walked only 27 in 216 innings. He walked the guy you'd least want to, Henderson, to start the game. Now he's out full on Lansford with Conseco on deck. Delayed steal. Three and two, you can do it with Carney Lansford. No outs, didn't get a good jump, but he was on the move. You know, there was a stretch for Jimmy Key and when he had the tired arm, he was still throwing strikes, but he wasn't really controlling the strike zone, and there was a little difference. Didn't quite have the movement on the fastball or the sharpness to his curve. Ricky goes. The ball is popped wide of first again. Junior Felix from right field racing over. But he has no play. Two faces we haven't yeah. seen in the playoffs yet. Felix in right field and Manny Lee instead of Nelson Liriano at second base. George Bell is DHing tonight. Mookie Wilson moves from right to left. Mosby remains in center. And those last two pitches as we look at Manny Lee, he was covering and he was leaving way too soon. Ricky is not getting a good jump to steal. When the ball is in the hitting area. He's less than a third of the way down those last two pitches. And Tony Fernandez came over and said, do not vacate that right side too soon. He takes off. It's ball four. Well, that's more than a game's worth of walks for Jimmy Key if you go by his average. Ernie, what's going to have a conversation with him? And you just saw Ricky Henderson, who disrupted the focus of Jimmy Key. Walks for nine innings. Makes these first two very unusual, but that's the pressure that Ricky Henderson puts on any pitcher. Now Conseco, and the A's have grabbed the 2 0 lead without his help. Missed half of game two with a migraine headache. 0 for 5 in the series, as you see, four strikeouts, and 0 for his last 23 postseason at bats. Now Ricky becomes dangerous against the left hander. 
What a lead he's got. Oh, my. Fly ball right field. Junior Felix has it lined up. Henderson back to tag. Lansford tagging at first, only to draw a throw. Oh, no. Felix on course it for man. third. Misses no. the cutoff man, and it's a fundamental mistake Just right off the bat by the Toronto Blue Jays. They did some of that in the first two games. Three balls falling in the outfield. That might have been caught and did not been misjudged. A terrific talent, 21-year-old junior Felix out of the Dominican Republic. There is no way he's going to get Ricky Henderson. And he throws an infield fly, and it allows Lansford to go to second base. Removes the double play. And I told you earlier, this is a team that does hit into a lot of double plays. And McGuire susceptible to that, but the double play no longer in order because they failed to hold Lansford at first. Infield will play back and concede it. Fouled off. You know, it can safely hit that ball to right field. Manny Lee was standing on second base. I mean, the whole right side was open. And uh, you could probably see at the top of your screen in our replays uh, when that ball was hit. But Ricky is disrupted and got this whole team on edge. McGuire four for eight in the series with a double and a homer. And again, Lee was lurching towards second base in behind Lansford as key work to the plate. And I don't know why, because you know he's not going anywhere with third base occupied. Sure, he's trying to hold him a little closer so he can't score on a base hit. But you end up holding him close, and the guy shoots one through the right side, and you don't even get an out out of him. Here's the 0-2 pitch. Up high. And McGuire's been locked in. He had a good September. Three at ball game the other day. And every ball was a bullet off his bat in game two. Inside, two and two. Bob, the Oakland A's played four games a year after the All-Star break. And they hit seven home runs in those four ball games was open at times so Tony La Russa has more than Ricky Henderson Bash brothers been somewhat silent so far in the air to right it's Felix's play as Henderson tags Lansford does the same junior throws for third Lansford has the ball hit him and kick off to the side Henderson scores and it's one nothing Oakland without benefit of a hit The air went out of the crowd already. It was about as loud as we've ever heard them here. While this is going on and the ball hits Lansford, Ricky Henderson was hustling as hard as he could in case there was a tag play. He wanted to be across home plate before the tag was made. And the umpires were aware of it and were all lined up to make sure in the event there was a tag. So the A's score first for the first time in the series. A ball to Henderson, who had a homer in game one off Steve. Also has a double. Three hits and eight trips. He hit 250 during the regular year with 15 home runs. I'm sure Jimmy Key feels if he can get out of this with just one run, after the way this inning started, he'd be very happy. Prevent a big inning, and he does. Mosby and Felix. It'll be Lloyd. And they settle for the one. Henderson let off with a walk, scored on the sack fly by McGuire. Cito Gaston, down 2-0, sends out this lineup. Mosby, Wilson, McGriff, Bell in left field the first two games. DH is in the cleanup spot. Fernandez remains fifth. Witt will catch. Gruber at third. Manny Lee, a switch hitter at second base, makes his first appearance. Junior Felix, who also hits from both sides. Plays for the first time in right field, hitting ninth against Storm Davis, a perhaps deceptive 19 and 7. Check the ERA. He also allowed more hits than innings pitched by a substantial number and had a modest strikeout to walk ratio of 91 to 61. Except the last two months, or at least six weeks, he might have been their best pitcher. You know, the strangest part about this lineup is the man who isn't there for the Blue Jays, Nelson Luriano. 
He's been on base four times. Two walks, two stolen bases. Hit the ball hard. Phillips robbed him, and he's not starting. He took batting practice. He's not hurt. I mean, he's a guy with Mosby and Ms. Mookie Wilson struggling with low on base percentage. I might have let him off. The 0-2 pitch to Mosby is high. Ten base hits for Toronto, only one for extra bases. Ritz home run. Mosby bounces one down to McGuire. He short hops it and makes the play himself. And yes, Storm Davis, like all the other right-handed starters, throws a fork bump. affectionate greeting from Mookie Wilson. Two for six in the series. 298 as a Blue Jay. One nothing Oakland bottom of the first. And Mookie swings and misses. Talk to Ray Fossey, now one of the Oakland Athletics broadcasters, who talks to the great staffs. So he said the last time out against Kansas City, Storm Davis going for his 20, threw harder than he did all last year and all this year. But a good curve, fork ball, a little sailor, a cut fastball. Mookie nubs one to short. Gallego comes charging in, quick release, and gets him at first. With the condition of Walt Weiss coming off the knee surgery, not 100%, you don't lose anything with Gallego there. Not as fast as Walt Weiss when Walt Weiss is healthy, but he's so quick. Knows who's running, Mookie Wilson. Shows a strong throwing arm. That's the improvement for Gallego. The second baseman basically last year, but once he started playing a lot at short, his arm strengthened. It stretched out. McGriff, one for eight in the series. Hasn't had an extra base hit of any kind since mid-September. Hasn't had a home run since September 4th. He and George Bell, the three four hitters, are a combined three for 16 so far. All three hit singles. And really, if the first two guys don't get on, why would you want to take a chance to give these guys home run pitches? The three and four hitters. They always say the fifth hitter behind the fourth. Well, he's important, but if the first two are getting on, you've got to pitch the three and four. Played up Dale Ford, Darrell Cousins at first, Rick Reed at second, Steve Palermo at third, Davey Phillips on the left field line, Dan Morrison calling the plays down the right field line. Davis's one-two pitch to McGriff. Hit toward the hole, but there's Phillips. Oh From what would be the outfield grass, he throws him out. Phillips has been the defensive star. The view from the Hard Rock Cafe. Steinbach, Parker, and Phillips in the top half of the second. And Jimmy Key's first pitch is a strike. Steinbach had the single in game one. He struck out his other three times. Hassey played the second game. Off-speed pitch. Hit to Fernandez. What hands he's got. He could short hop a rattlesnake. Made only six errors all year. He did not have an easy hop either. There are times Tony will take that backhanded and throw on the run. If you remember Roy McMillan, who used to surround the ball and get his momentum going toward first base, that's who Fernandez just looked like. Made it look easy, didn't he? Some booze for Parker, who stood and admired his long home run on Wednesday afternoon in the Coliseum, and some of the Jays took exception. Kelly Gruber specifically and Parker shrugged it off he said hey I've been hitting home runs in the big league since Kelly Gruber was a toddler I don't care what he says he's 1 0 pitch they check it third nope a 
Jimmy Key mixing in his change of speeds off the breaking ball early in this game. Trying to establish that a little and make the fastball better. Fastball sails high, 3-0. Right down the middle. Parker hopeful of making his third World Series appearance. 79 for the Pirates when they came from a 3-1 deficit and beat the Orioles. Last year for the A's when they were upset by the Dodgers. The bat shatters. In comes Mookie Wilson and he makes the catch. Last night, Tony, I was at Wrigley Field with Tom Seaver, and of course, for the purists, you've got to take Wrigley or Fenway or Tiger Stadium. But of the new ballparks, this is really state of the art, and it is in an assembly line ballpark. It's unlike any other. You look around and you really get a sense of place. It has a character all its own. There's an electric atmosphere here, even during the regular season. And should the Jays get it in gear tonight, this place is going to be wild. But they got to do something first. And that spacious center field, and from right to left center field, has saved this pitching staff coming out of old Exhibition Stadium. Changed the philosophy of pitching, I think, for this whole staff. Al Woodmire, the pitching coach, recognized it. We used to have to trick people over there. Change ups, curves, change of speeds. And the fastball badly get blown out in right field there, but not here. They become a fastball pitching staff, the left handers. Here comes Felix. Nice catch. And he picks it off his shoe tops. So one, two, three seconds with the help of a nice play by Junior to cap it. George Bell ready to give it a go against Storm Davis. Davis, as we mentioned, 19 and 7 despite the ERA of 4.36. There were 13 pitchers in the American League who won more than 15 games. Of those 13, only one had an ERA over four. This guy, he benefited from tremendous run support and a great bullpen. Bell fouls it off. And as George Bell dug his customary hole with his right foot to get settled in the batter's box, Steinbeck just watched his foot and watched to see if he's going to move off the plate. He's moved up on the plate a little bit when he was in his hot streak in August. And they've been burying him inside, breaking his back. And he looks like he has moved off the plate just a tad. There are times when George Bell will almost have his head in the strike zone in that crouch. And what do they do? They're a little fastball away, a cut fastball. In on his fists, and he's behind on the count one and two. Do not look for Storm Davis to be here at the finish. In 31 starts, he went the distance only once, and he's thrown only two complete games in the last three years. He's averaged between five and six innings per start. Still one and two. Well, I think it's incredible that you can win 19 ball games. We talked about the ERA, but he did get hot at the end, and do it in just 169 innings pitched. That'll tell you how Dave Duncan, the pitching coach, monitors his innings, and he senses it before he loses it and gets in trouble and gets him out for this fine bullpen. He strikes George Bell out. The first K, Davis has put in the scorebook tonight. From up top, you'll see the location, in or out. It's a little cut fastball. It used to be called a slider probably years ago. Breaks six inches, maybe. Very hard. Fernandez one for seven through the first two games 257 for the year 11 home runs for him talking to Dave Yoakum one of the Blue Jays advanced scouts asking about Storm Davis he said boy this guy really uses both sides of the plate well we saw it on George Bell here he goes away with the sinker Gallego had him played well drifts to his left and throws him out five straight retired by Storm Davis to open the game Dave Duncan. 
keeping the charts. I don't know if there's a pitching coach, or maybe now, but when he started as a pitching coach, Cleveland and the White Sox from La Russa, that he was so sophisticated as far as and meticulous with records and location and change of speed and watching the speed from the speed guns. A ball to Witt, who's game one homer off Dave Stewart is the only extra base hit the Blue Jays have in the two games so far. Bouncing ball foul. So, uh, you had a nice relaxing off day yesterday, huh? A <laughs> lot of fun? It was fun. Listen to you guys, you in town. We hope Ben gets back so you don't have to fly all the way back up to the Bay Area for the Giants game. Well, I can't split myself in two. It's got to be one or the other this weekend. <laughs> Yesterday happened to be an off day. No, that must have been a real thrill for you, not just working with the, the old guy, future Hall of Famer, but Wrigley Field are here. And you don't even look or sound tired. We'll see what happens come the eighth or ninth. I'm deteriorating rapidly. Really is a sample of the best of both oh, worlds. Yeah. Mm. You know, Wrigley, the classic park. And you have to tip your cap. If you're going to be in a new park, this one's really something. The one-two pitch. Struck him out. What location he's at so far tonight. Six straight retired. Two strikeouts in the second. Back after this from your local station. Championship Series is brought to you by your local authorized Porsche dealer. And by Anheuser-Busch. We brew our fine quality beers to be enjoyed responsibly. Remember, know when to say when. Well, you have to like the artwork on the kisser, but doesn't he realize he's wearing Oakland colors with his T-shirt? Kind of spoils the effect. There hasn't been a hit in the game yet. The A's got a run in the first without benefit of one. Here's Gallego, the number nine hitter. An off-speed pitch in for a strike. Henderson walked, so did Lansford. They each moved up on a Canseco fly ball to right. And then Henderson tagged and scored from third as McGuire flew out to right. 0-2 to Gallego. When Jimmy Key is at his best, he walked the first two in the ballgame, as Bob said. You see a tremendous change of speeds pitcher on his fastball, on his curveball. And when he gets the right handers looking away for the little sinker or turned over change up, he busts them inside. Master changing speed and location. There's his first strikeout as it burrowed in on him. Talk about appropriate attire on a night when Jimmy Key has to keep their hopes alive. As far as we are aware, there were no warnings issued. Talk to the supervisor and umpires and before this game started with the war of words through the newspaper. I think they felt that was enough, but they don't have to give warnings anymore. Henderson on base, 8 of 10 trips. You know, all that publicity probably worked to Ricky Henderson's favor. Now, they may be afraid to come inside on him if the ball gets away and hits him. Maybe a warning or an ejection, although that might be a little severe. Want to move a guy off the plate, you better be quiet about it. Just go about your business and not hit him. Do the brush back pitch. The thing to keep in mind about Ricky, even as you say to yourself, don't walk him, it's as good as a double. Don't let him get on base and disrupt everything and pick up the pace for his team. He has uncommon power for a leadoff man. As you see, he's dinged key for four home runs head to head. You know, sometimes that these scouting reports are a general overview compiled by Steve Horn, our stat man, from various scouts who've seen these players. But it depends what the pitcher's got. I mean, they say pitcher got high. If he didn't have a good enough fastball, he's got to go with that sinker ball. Here it is on one and two. Off-speed breaking ball outside. And I think most pitchers like Jimmy Key or Flanagan, those who are change of speeds and control, 
Uh, they want to know where the strengths of the hitter is, but and they want to know the scouting reports, but they're going to watch the hitter's reaction to their pitches. If he's late, 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 they may stay with a fastball. Inside and low, and they flirt with it again, three and two. Jimmy Key a little disgusted. He thought he had the breaking ball when Ernie Witt caught it. It was out of the strike zone. He may have felt that when it crossed the front part of the place, the plane, that it wasn't the strike zone. And this guy's got a postage stamp for a strike zone, doesn't he? Hit hard and fair. Extra bases for Ricky Henderson. He speeds around first. The ball is in play. Untouched by a fan, although several reached out. And a double for Henderson. Nine of 11. He's been on base these three games already. You got it. Ooh. You can see how far off the third base bag Kelly Gruber is playing. It is something that the left-handers want him to do. Key, Flanagan, and when Cerruti was a starter. When they sink the fastball away to right-handers, they feel that more balls will be hit between Gruber and Fernandez. And they get burned down the line a lot when the guy changes up, misses the location. But that's where the left-handers want Kelly. Have we had some performances in both playoffs so far? Clark and Grace in the National League. Kevin Mitchell with a couple of home runs. Henderson in this playoff. He wheels and doesn't release. Now both middle infielders will have to probably cheat a little closer to protect against Ricky stealing third. Ruber comes in a little bit closer. That's what's happening. He's there going. He goes. Here's the throw from Witt. It's high and he's in there. That ties a postseason record. And he does it in two games plus three innings with his seventh steal. The quickness is incredible. And you can see Manny Lee holding him close. Doesn't even bother him. Fernandez holds his position. Kelly Gruber tries to hold as long as he can. Doesn't matter. The throw is all right. Witt had to throw over the top of the head of Lansford, so the throw went high, but it wouldn't have mattered if it was right in the bag. Gruber and McGriff will come in now, and they're creeping in in the middle of the diamond to about halfway. Lansford lines at the center. In comes Mosby. It falls in front of him. Ricky clapping his hands as he comes trotting home. The man who scored more runs in this decade than any player has scored both runs tonight. And Oakland leads 2-0. And he has done more than put numbers on the board. He has imposed his will upon the Toronto Blue Jays. Well, his agent, Richie Bree, is in town. I saw him around the ballpark. And Richie's got some of the top players in the game, including Mookie Wilson, Hubie Brooks, and you can go on and on. And the kind of finish that Ricky's having in postseason play... I don't know how long he's going to keep going. Maybe into the World Series. Can you imagine what he's going to command next year? On the open market as a free agent? And Seiko. Remember he hit the Grand Slam off Tim Belcher in Game 1 of the World Series at Dodger Stadium last October. Since he hit the jackpot, he's hit the skids in postseason play. 0 for his last 24 in World Series and playoff competition. This was the scene of his return to the major leagues after the injury that caused him to miss the first half of the season. Cito Gaston now coming out to talk you know, with this, Jimmy Key. This might be more than a talk as Jim Acker is starting to throw again. Cito may just stay there until Dale Ford comes out and then let Dale Ford have it. Cito's asking simply, where, was the, where were those pitches? Are they near the strike zone? Do they have the strike zone? If Bernie Witt says yes, Dale Ford's going to have to go out there sooner or here he comes, and you see if Cito gives him a blast. Jimmy Key's been upset, thinking that some of those were close enough to be called strikes. Yes, and not going to argue a strike call. He'd be rejected. The most upset I saw Cito Gaston was the last weekend of the season after he thought an umpire missed a call in Detroit might have cost him a game. And he let some other umpires have it. They didn't clinch this thing to the second last game of the season. Tony, let's flash back quickly to that home run by Conseco in game one of the World Series against Belcher. Gave them a 4 0 lead. Now, watch where it hits. As it clears the center field fence, it almost conks our cameraman, Jimmy <laughs> Mott. It hit the camera and literally dented it. Later, Conseco autographed it for him. 
and Jimmy is working tonight. There he is, but on the first base side. But still, he cowers a bit when Jose heads into the batter's box. It was great before that first game in the off day when they were setting up the equipment. He went up to Conseco with the ball and said, would you autograph this? And Conseco looked at him funny. He said, don't you remember me? And he said, oh, I remember you. You're the guy I almost hit. Where are you going to be in this league championship series? He finally breaks the drought. That's his first hit. After 24 consecutive hitless at-bats in postseason play, Lansford stops at second. So after one out, a double by Henderson, Ricky steals third, Lansford brings him home with a single to center, then Canseco rolls one through the middle, and here's McGuire. And that's what strength will do to you. He got jammed. And as soon as the ball ran in underneath his fist, Fernandez was leading to his right, but a strong Canseco on the artificial surface muscle it to Fernandez left. McGuire had three hits Wednesday. A sack fly his first time up tonight. Doesn't get it. Canseco down at first. This was the scene of his return. First series after the All-Star break and his very first game back after missing half the season with the wrist injury. He proceeds to go two for three with a homer and three RBIs. Oh and two. Manny Lee, and every time somebody's on second, it's happening right now with Lansford. He's just stationed right within the stride of second base when the ball's going home. And you might get away with it with a McGuire because he's basically a pull hitter. But you leave so much open through that right side. One and two to Mark. If there's a Bay Area series and Ricky's doing his part to make sure Oakland gets there the Giants tied up at one with the Cubs game three tomorrow if there's a Bay Area series it'd be a reunion of first basemen who were Olympic teammates Will Clark and this guy Mark McGuire toward the hole picked up by Gruber they get one Lee turns and makes the double play. And he made it under a lot of pressure from Jose Canseco. Nice play, Gruber. The ball's out in left field. As Gruber steps to the plate, another look at the double play he started. Watch Canseco try and hook him with his left leg. Game one, Ricky's slide upset the timing of Liriano. They didn't turn it. Lee managed to get out of Conseco's way this time. Davis has retired the first six he's faced. Gruber drives one to right. Conseco goes back, not quite to the track. Gruber, who made the All Star team as a reserve third baseman, is now 0 for 8 in this series. He hit 290 for the year with 18 homers. Has Storm Davis thrown a ball yet? I guess a couple. Thrown four. Four pitches that were not either swung at or out of the strike zone. And he's been on both edges of the plate. Manny Lee, a converted shortstop. At second base, not too many are going to get a chance to play short with Tony Fernandez around. Davis had three starts this year against Toronto. One no decision and two victories. Manny Lee doesn't bunt a whole lot, even from the left side. He's not a real fast runner. He's got good quickness, but Lansford and McGuire were up close looking for a possible bunt. Three and oh. Junior Felix, who has power, is on deck. In there, three and one.
We'll count now to Manny Lee. I think I've got to make him throw a strike right though. We're not hitting eighth or ninth in the lineup. We went three and oh. I'd force him to throw three straight strikes. He's come back to run the count out full. And here's a line drive right at Gallego. So let's see if Felix can break Davis's string. You know, we talked about Duncan. We showed him a while ago, and here's where that comes into play. You know, when you can coordinate your defense, the defensive positioning with where your pitchers are going to try and throw the ball, you get those numbers in your favor, the percentages in your favor. And he's one of the best. I, Whitey Herzog may be the best in the major leagues with that big ballpark because Whitey keeps all his own charts. And, boy, he doesn't have to have somebody else on his bench moving defense and players. He can do it himself. Strike one to Felix. Of course, the Blue Jays are going to have a significant amount of power in the lineup for some time with McGriff and Bell, but a lot of people think they've got to change the offensive direction of their team with this ballpark. Let's see if this stays in play. Lansford racing back, Gallego from short, and it drops untouched. A lot of people think that the Blue Jays are going to have to become a slash and dash kind of team. That's why they went out and got Mookie, one of the reasons. I don't know if they're going to be able to keep him, but this is like Kansas City or St. Louis. Where it says 375 in right center field, that is mislabeled. It's more like 386 there. And Mookie, when he did play center field, and cover that ground out there that's that's not the proper dimension Felix with a weak swing it's the third strikeout for Davis three perfect innings and a two nothing lead Jimmy Key back to work in the fourth and trailing two nothing you can divide his season into three very distinct parts he opened strongly from opening day to late May. He was six and two. Then as it became apparent that his shoulder was weakening and bothering him. He went through a stretch from June 1st to early August when he went one and eleven. They sat him down for 15 days with a tired arm and he bounced back strong winning six of his last seven decisions from mid August to the end of the year. What happened to was April and May. He was on just under a 300 inning pace for the season. Just a little over a year removed from elbow surgery. And one of the reasons he was is because the bullpen was performing so poorly. Tom Hankey wasn't doing well. Dwayne Ward wasn't doing well. And he was pushing himself to try and finish ball games and give them more innings. And it ended up hurting him. Tom Hankey along with John Cerruti it be tough for Cerruti, their best starter for three months, and he's in the pen. The 1-1 pitch to Dave Henderson. Two balls and a strike. Check it. A called strike two. Dale Ford taking his own sweet time about making the call. One and two. Strike three. Little fastball that started inside, peered off the plate, throws Henderson and tails back in. Right where Ernie Witt sets up. So right there and he got it. Sunday on NBC at 12:30 Eastern Time, OJ with the inside scoop. On the Raider move from Mike Shanahan to Art Shell. Then this lineup of games. And there are also two late contests San Diego, Denver, Kansas City, Seattle. That's Sunday, beginning with NFL Live. Steinbach robbed of a hit on a nice play by Fernandez. You talk about three different kinds of seasons for Jimmy Key. How about two for him? Outstanding up in the All Star break at 300. And after that, because has to catch a little bit more and play some other positions. Whoa. -oh. He gets under one yep, and under. doesn't get all of it. Mookie Wilson toward the line to make the catch. Well, he put a good swing on that baby. In this ballpark, you never know when it's going to carry or not. It's even more unpredictable when it's open and there's some win. And there were times where they, Freddie McGriff would crush the ball in the center field and it would die. Other times, as when Oakland was here for those four games, the ball was carrying. 
our best guess is it'll be open for the early afternoon start tomorrow and then closed for the late afternoon game Sunday assuming there is a fifth game Keita Parker well, don't you think it's gonna have to be a little bit warmer than it was this afternoon because you're on your way back from Chicago but it was windy and cold don't know what the exact temperature was but if they kept it open tomorrow afternoon you'd be freezing in here well, they're we'll a hardy lot these are Canadians they're used to this oh and two to Parker actually and we apologize to our Canadian viewers we say this for the benefit of those in the United States who might may not have a sense of it Toronto is approximately at the same latitude as Minneapolis not that Minneapolis is the balmiest city in the United States but this isn't exactly the Yukon either the one two pitch here's a drive to deep right center Parker got all of this and it's over the fence and gone he got a hanging curveball from Jimmy Key that he just stayed with never gave an inch oh he has a little glimpse over at Kelly Gruber as if to say well, how about that little guy whoa a little staring contest oh and he jumped all over that one and two hanging curve if you're gonna gloat you got to produce and the A's have done all the producing in this series Ernie Witt wanted it down and away and it is up and away that showed you the height this will show you the location almost down the middle so Parker who had not hit a home run in over 90 at bats in playoff and World Series competition until game two now is homered in consecutive games of this series three nothing Oakland Phillips drives one toward the gap Felix over and that'll do it one hit but it was a big one another look from the top of the dome watch Parker Tony just took one little glance that's all the message is very clear take that Mr. Gruber he didn't walk out of the batter's box on Jimmy Key he started into a trot right when the ball left the bat maybe because he wasn't sure it went out I mean, Kelly Gruber's a very tough kid about 195 pounds very compact but we're talking about Dave Park at about 245 or so we go to the last of the fourth top of the order Jays haven't had a base runner yet 2 and 0 the count to Mosby it'll be interesting to see what happens to Dave Parker next time he comes up and again you start talking about the olden days they're gone folks but some of the things gotten away with now could not have done years ago but this whole team styles Ricky and Dave Henderson Dave Parker Lloyd has a flair at times when he's playing well let me ask you this question if somebody does go sprawling maybe more than once here's the 3 1 pitch and Mosby's aboard the first Toronto base runner if they do knock a couple of them down and there is a brawl he'll be the first one out there okay that's what he was when the his hitters were getting knocked down every time George Ballard go out Cedar was there pulling people off him. he's tough but you run out of matchups from Toronto's side out comes Conseco out comes Parker out comes McGuire the emotional level gets such we're not trying to drum something up that may not even happen but you're so emotionally involved if you think somebody's poking fun at you or belittling you you don't care how big they are it's the old don't kick a sleeping dog Wilson at the plate Lansford in close a ball and a strike to Mookie You know, three runs down. Steinbach, a good arm, very quick release. See for Mookie, Lansford up tight. 
But it doesn't completely take your running game away, but it sure puts a big dent in it, unless you're Ricky Henderson. Storm Davis, as you may recall, lost two games in the World Series last year. He was the loser during Hershiser's heroics in the second game and the fifth game. He did have one strong start in the league championship series, a no decision against Roger Clemens. That's out of play. A game Oakland eventually won as part of their sweep of the Red Sox. You know, Mookie's known as a, basically a fastball hitter. He likes the ball down a little bit. You know, you can beat the ball in the dirt on this turf and beat it out. But to this point, the Oakland pitching staff has been able to throw fastballs by him. I mean, he's still very late. And in spite of the fork ball, that pitch keeps you honest. Keeps you late on the fastball. This is a team that basically pitches off their fastball, and that's Dave Duncan. Mosby at first, nobody out. The 2-2 pitch, a liner through the middle. There's Toronto's first hit. Mosby stops at second. who led the American League with 36 home runs. The tying run at the plate. Don't know what the speed gun says, but it appears that Storm Davis is up in the high 80s, maybe close to 90. Freddie McGriff was late. That's got to be 88, 89, 90, somewhere in that area, I guess, Bob. That may be on the slower gun, too. This is a base hit in front of Conseco. The bases will be loaded. It was hit so sharply that they play it one base at a time. Duncan. didn't have a base runner through three then Mosby walked Wilson singled McGriff hit one right on the nose to right they're loaded with nobody out Cito Gaston has not seen many big innings for this Toronto Blue Jays ball club recently you look through their lineup and you see some of the players McGriff Bow, Witt Gruber capable and they've gone several weeks game eight to one against the Tigers and they're staring at a big end right here if George Bow can do something struck out his first time in the vicinity of the letters and a called strike Davis working from the stretch got in on him he fouls it back toward us Matt Young with that good slider worked on a fork ball. Now Todd Burns ordinarily has a real good curveball. Struggling with that late in the season. They're up for Tony LaRusso. The 0-2 pitch. Here's a drive to center field. May or may not be deep enough. Henderson lost it. Now he backpedals to make the catch. Mosby scores. Wilson to third. McGriff holds first. Bell with a sack fly, and it's 3-1 Oakland.
Dave Henderson has a history of trouble in dome stadiums. He had two or three balls fall right next to him in the Metrodome this year, and he confesses to having difficulty picking the ball up off the roof. I don't know if he has similar difficulties here, but he looked lost for a moment on that ball. Most dome stadiums, if you take your eye off the ball, run to a spot, you have difficulty picking it up out of the girders, which is what a lot of good outfielders do. Pick a spot, take a beeline. That last fastball to Bell was perhaps as hard as Davis has tried to throw. When the strike him out or pop him up in the infield, and Bell was strong enough to get it to right center field. Lansford in close at third. They look for the DP in the middle. The pitch is high, 2-0. Hit sharply by the diving McGuire. Possible extra bases. Fernandez looking for a double. Conseco kicks it. They're waving McGriff home. Here comes the throw. He is safe. McGuire holding McGriff couldn't get off the bag quickly enough on a ball that he might have fielded had he been in normal position. Canseco off the line trying to make a running stop and can't come up with it cleanly. And the Jays playing aggressively send McGriff home. Fernandez trailing the play winds up at third with only one out and here's Witt. Infield in for Ernie Witt. This might drop. Henderson charging. Toronto has the lead. Kelly Gruber steps in. Hit and run. How about that? Cito Gaston in the flow of things sends Ernie Wett, the catcher. Al Widmar, the pitching coach, next to him. Figure you got him on the ropes. Gruber hits the ball hard, starts your catcher, maybe create a hole. Gruber looking for his first hit. This is his ninth at bat. He flied to right in the third. McGuire holding Witt. And that's out of play 0 2. I'll tell you when those first two guys get on, and we've seen that with Ricky and Lansford. When they get on, they set it, don't they, for the 3 4 5 hitters? That was Mosby with a walk and Wilson with a single. Changing the whole inning. Davis has never lost to Toronto as a member of the Oakland A's. 4 0 against them. Still 1 and 2 to Gruber. Storm had a 3-0 lead. Had set down the first nine. Mosby walked. Wilson singled. So did McGriff. Bell with a sacrifice fly. Fernandez triples home two. Witt singles softly to center. And a 3-0 deficit is a race. Toronto's in front 4-3. And the Sky Dome is buzzing in the fourth. Bouncing ball could be two. Gallego steps on the bag. Completes the double play. But the damage is done. Four in the fourth, and we're right back after these messages from your local station. 
Game 3 of the American League Championship Series is brought to you by Dr. Pepper and Dr. Pepper bottlers throughout the USA and by the makers of new Co-Advil. For the record, the ball Fernandez hit was originally scored a triple, which sounded fishy because Canseco kicked it along the line, and now they change it almost immediately to a double and an error. And yet, most right fielders don't have the speed of Canseco, and if he hadn't slapped it down at full speed, the ball's all the way to the corner. So it was a tough call for the official scores. It was tough to give him an error. The legs look like they're... Uh, a little bit better. He's having some problems running. That's why he's not stealing much. One of the four runs in the inning for Toronto. Unearned. Suddenly, Key has the lead. The pitch to Gallego. A high fly ball. Mosby coming in in center for the first out. One of those situations when your team takes over the lead, coming back as emotionally as they have in front of the Sky Dome crowd, you want to shut them down and get your team back at bat as quickly as you can so they can perhaps try and tack on some more. Ricky Henderson. On base eight consecutive times. Nine of 11 times overall in the series. He's walked doubled and stolen a base tonight his seventh steal of the series off speed pitch for a strike Ricky does question almost every close call and a lot of those that are right down the middle sees what he can get from the home plate umpire the A's are a very easy team for the opposition's fans to dislike in a hurry an easy team for their own fans to embrace and a colorful team a team with true identity all around the country. They've established themselves. But they have some guys who can annoy you. There's a squibber down to McGriff. Henderson's an easy guy to portray as a villain if you're on the other side of the fence. Conseco's kind of your Paul Bunyan, perceived as having a darker side. Is there anything Parker different about struts a little bit. Anything different about this ball club when they had Reggie, Bird Camp, and Eris could hot dog? Not at all. Philly North. And remember how... Many people in network telecasts, World Series time, disliked them because they had those awful-looking mustaches, and they became America's darlings when they won three consecutive World Championships. Let's see if McGriff has room. Nope. These are perceptions, and the emotions, and sometimes irrational responses are part of the fun of sports. This is the kind of guy you love. He's a sage veteran with a great career if he's on your side. He's a guy who rubs it in. If you're thinking with your heart from the other side. As long as nobody gets hurt, it's good, clean fun. And then there's Carney Lansford. Quiet, soft-spoken. And a 336 hitter in 1989. Boy. Going to right field very often like that. That's one of the keys to his success. Huge turn as Felix guns it back in. That's why you want that speed on this artificial surface with these spacious alleys. And Junior Felix, who has sprinter speed, he was a track man down in the Dominican Republic. Coordinator of scouting, Epi Guerrero. They say discovered Felix at a track meet that he never played baseball. That's become apocryphal. He did play as a kid. Conseco fly to right singled up the middle Lansford at first has walked and singled twice huh. he made this ballpark look like old exhibition stadium yesterday during the workout he's hitting in the fourth deck Is that the right number of digits? 1900, no way, Jose. You know, I haven't called that hotline in a few days, and I missed my chance to get 
all the inside dope on the migraine headache. What an oversight on my part. Here's the 0-2 pitch. First to throw over. Thought in Jimmy Key and maybe Ernie Witt's mind too set the signal for the bench that Lansford, over 30 stolen bases this season, might be going and get in scoring position or if he got throw out, give Conseco a fresh count. You mentioned old Exhibition Stadium. And Seiko had a three-homer game there last year. It was an extra inning game. It went 16. Aside from being strong, he's got a very good swing. He swings hard. But he's got an idea of the strike zone. That's his second consecutive base hit. And on both of those, Bob, Jimmy Key, I believe, got the ball exactly where he wanted to. Right underneath his fist. And he muscled one to the left of Tony Fernandez, his last at bat, and this one he muscles between Fernandez and Gruber. It's the A's sixth hit. The Blue Jays have four, but all of them came in their four-run fourth. McGuire with a sacrifice fly. And he grounded into a smartly turned inning ending double play in the third. See what they've got Kelly Gruber. Cito Gaston probably does. He used to set the defenses along with being the hitting instructor before he took the manager's job. But he's playing more on the third base line now, Gruber. There he is. Two on, two out. For some of that, too, is with a strong guy like McGuire. You want to prevent the double down the line so the runner at first base cannot score, too. Right, give a little more ground to your left. Left center field. Mosby calls Wilson off. The A's strand two to the bottom of the fifth. 4 3 Toronto. Storm Davis. To the bottom of the fifth, we get near the time when they start watching him more and more closely. Manny Lee, the first hitter, lined hard to Gallego at shortstop in the third. This is his first appearance in the postseason. For a while, Cino Gaston was playing Liriano a couple days, Manny Lee a couple days, just to try to keep to keep them both involved. It's left handers he usually plays Manny Lee. Fourth ball. Easy chance for McGuire. Where are we? Well, <laughs> someone getting a jump on a luxury suite in the hotel surrounding the center field scoreboard. Obviously, one of our engineers. Does he know what that nap will cost him if he stays the night? Aren't those about $800? Each one's a suite per night. I guess there's a certain amount of tickets involved. A discount now, though, as you can see, they hadn't even made the bed, just a bare yes. mattress, so they might, you know, knock it off to five, six hundred. Junior Felix fouls it off. This guy hit the first pitch he saw in the major leagues for a home run off the Angels' Kirk McCaskill this May. He had a five or six weeks that were just extraordinary. Went up to Boston for a weekend series inside the park Grand Slam 11 RBIs in three games three multi hit games but he, little injuries started hurting his hand his shoulder he crashed into the wall in Yankee Stadium little ankle problem he's a switch hitter another one of the fine young Dominican Republic ball players on this team oh. tumultuous season in 88 suspended for half yeah. the year at Knoxville their double A affiliate for insubordination. Right center field. Conseco and Dave Henderson chasing it. It's really carrying. It is caught at the fence by Dave Henderson. What do they underestimate his power? He's hit some balls. He hit one in Boston in right field halfway up the bleachers that people were saying only Ted Williams hit him there. He hit one in California. Center fielder, the batting eye. The only other guy to hit one in the area was Reggie Jackson. And a very shallow the ball was hit very, very high. A nice, nice catch by Dave Henderson. He didn't take his eye off that one at all. Fear of losing it. He went a long way. 
Junior Felix upper body, he looks like Mike Tyson. The very big arms, he weighs only about 170. Mosby grounded out. Then began the four-run rally in the fourth with a walk. into shallow left Ricky Henderson has time and a very quick last half of the fifth nothing Ricky does will please the fans here watch where Dave Henderson starts from in center field shallow and over toward left center field Felix hits it what looks like a gapper to right center Henderson finds the wall and his right fielder Canseco takes it about two and a half, three feet off the canvas. That was a long run. And an extremely encouraging sign in your picture in dead center field. The fans here upset with Toronto's two defeats on the road. And some of them in a blame the messenger mood have taken it out more on me this time than you. In 85, you were the focus of their wrath. This time it shifted to me, which is real teamwork. We've kind of kind of divided the rancor here. Well, I think we should all understand the game and the players are where it's at. Some of the local media here would understand that. 1-1 one, one pitch to Dave Henderson. The Jays most certainly alive tonight. Trailing 3-0 early and in danger of going down 3-0 in the series, they rally with four. Key nurses that lead into the sixth. Falls behind Dave Henderson, 3-1. Steinbach on deck, followed by Parker. be out of play in a full count it would appear because both pitchers have been pushed considerably that this game's gonna end up in the bullpen Storm Davis uh, you indicated earlier his numbers and Jimmy Key has been pushed pretty good so far the pitches with the two ox leading this off Jim Ackers throwing again I'd like to have him Key and maybe Acker and they have to throw Wells in for a couple of hitters or so and then get to Hankey. Here's Come a on. shot to right center. Mosby chasing after it off the top of the fence narrowly misses being a home run and a leadoff double for Dave Henderson. The tying run and scoring position in the sixth. You wonder with Acker having been up we just showed him if when Jimmy Key went out he had the conference with Cito Gast and Al Widmar the pitching coach saying I'll try and get you through this inning. And that may have been why he was up. Jim Acker in the start of the city. He got a pitch up after getting ahead of Dave Henderson. And here comes Al Widmar. You talk about some people have a few miles on him in this game. Widmar has been in almost every executive capacity along the way. Pitching coach, minor league manager, scout, and some 40 plus years, almost 50 years. And there's another guy that's got a few years on him too. Two of my favorite people, Al oh, Widmar great. and Ellis Clary who was There's a scout Alice. for an eternity for Calvin Griffith with the Senators and later with the Twins brief stint with the Browns during World War II 73 years of age and back in uniform and he's such a naturally funny man but his all time classic line came in 1970 on the road as he was almost constantly for the Twins scouting <laughs> and he suffered what was feared to be a fatal heart attack and as they put him on the stretcher and sped for the hospital he looked up gravely ill and said somebody get the mileage on the ambulance for my expense account <laughs> time and mileage he was actually pronounced dead he's been up for the last few months and during the regular season what Alice does is he usually sits in the stands and charts the game but during the league championships he's already got two world championship rings you talk about the Bob Allison's the Harmon Killebrews Jim Cotts they flocked to him as soon as they see him because he helped them all so much 
Now Steinbach to try and shoot the ball the other way with nobody down, a man on second. As Tony told you, tore it in the first half, cold in the second, 273 overall. Hits it to the left side and foul. Pull the string on a breaking line. Interesting with the defense, you've got Gruber up and McGriff. And by being up on this artificial surface, you know, at this stage of the game, I'm not sure he's going to be bunny. If he does, Jimmy Key's one of the best fielding pitchers in the game. He can take it himself for a catcher. When you cheat that much at first and third, and this stuff, it gives that guy so much more room to hit through. I think that'll be back at the corners. One and one. That's what the defense looks from up top. Gruber and McGriff still not playing their normal depth. Now Freddie McGriff is backed up. No, we didn't put the blimp in here. What a great shot. We've seen some outstanding shots of the strikes on the corners from that high camera. Center field Mosby. Henderson back to tag. He'll be able to get over easily. Potential tying run at third with one down here in the top of the sixth. It appears the ball's carrying today. Not that Junior Felix or Dave Henderson didn't hit the ball well, but the outfielders look like they're under it. And then when you see the outfielders start drifting, you know there's a pretty good carry. With all these people in here, around 49,000, another capacity. A little more humidity and a little more heat when the people get in here. And the ball seems to carry better. They sold out virtually every game the last two, two and a half months of the season. They may have four million in all-time attendance record next year. Infield comes in. Strike one to Parker. Dave Parker, I believe, figured, hey, look, I hit a breaking ball off before the home run last time up. He's going to throw me a fastball. And Jimmy Key came back with a curveball, but got it down and a little more away. One and one. It becomes pretty clear, given the fact that Key hasn't been masterful and Davis's history of not lasting deep into games, that this one could very well come down to Tom Henke against Dennis Eckersley. Out of play of the four games played so far in the two league championship series combined. None has been closer than three runs. To see that matchup, those two in the game at the same time, would be not unusual, but I think unlikely. You know, you're not going to put those two guys in in a tie game against each other, I don't think. Now, Toronto might use, use, use Hankey as early as they can, being down two games to nothing. He holds up, and it's two and two. Well, Toronto really can't afford to hold anything no, back, and Henke has worked just the one inning, and yesterday was an off day. So right. what is unlikely to happen in the regular season could very well happen here. I was more talking, thinking about Eckersley coming in the tie game. If it's ahead, he might be in there. He popped him up. Yeah. It's Fernandez. He got a big base hit. No balls, two strike count off Steve and flared that ball to left field to score the second run, making it three to two. After that came Ricky Henderson slide into second. They are trying to get Junior Felix to come in in right field. That's what the little delay was. Ernie Witt wouldn't get down in his crouch until they could signal Felix from the bench for Phillips sitting right handed. He might flare one and come on in. He brought in about 10 steps in right field. Phillips has twice flied out to Felix. Three for nine in the series. Hit 262 for the year. Chokes up high on the bat. And takes strike one. And you cannot put a number on how many runs he might have saved with his defensive play thus far. Remember the year when Dick Green in 74 against the Dodgers never got a base hit. And that some people felt he was the MVP of that series. He was sensational. Made that unbelievable diving play behind second base mm -hmm. and the, the flip from flat on his belly. Time is called.
That was the third straight A's World Championship. And the last one. There have been division titles since. And a pennant last year. But they haven't won it all since. 72, 73, and 74. Check swing foul on two. from the belt. Jimmy got the call on Saturday, second to last day of the regular season, and had only a so-so effort. But his teammates came from behind to win and put the Orioles away. That was the big Frank Wills outing. Four innings, just one hit, got the win, not eligible for postseason play. On one and two. He has pitched a lot of pressure games for a young pitcher. Now entering the prime of his career. But earlier in his career, he pitched in the 1985 playoffs for Toronto. Two years later, he got the ball on the last day of the regular season against the Tigers and pitched a masterpiece and lost 1-0 to Frank Tanana on Larry Herndon's last day home run. Phillips fouls another one off. And when the count went to one ball and two strikes, they moved Junior Felix in a, leave, a little closer in right field and more toward the line. You can see why. And Jimmy Key keeps running the fastball away, tailing it away. Phillips choking up now, just trying to get a piece of it. Junior Felix is vulnerable over his head, but they don't feel Phillips will hit it that far. He walked the first two men he faced. Nobody's walked since. He's given seven hits and three runs and leads here 4 3 as he tries to make it through the sixth. Tomorrow, Bob Welch, 17 and 8. And with a week's worth of rest against Flanagan of the Blue Jays, the former Cy Young Award winner, when with Baltimore, 8-10 and 10 this year, but an excellent history against Oakland, including two victories this season. 2-2. Two and two. Jimmy Key's had almost six full days. It was a day game, very short rest. to a night game tonight. And when Jimmy Key has had the luxury of those six days throughout his career, he's pitched a little bit better. He always seems to be a little bit stronger, more popping the fastball. But this Oakland team is pressuring him. He was ahead of Phillips. And now the count is full. What a bad he's having. Two. Now the payoff pitch. At second base, it's Manny Lee. Loving the soft line drive. Henderson led off with a double. Got to third, but no more. To the bottom of the sixth. 4 3 Toronto. And Mookie Wilson slices one foul. McGriffin Bell to follow here. And Bob, between innings, uh, when we were looking at the dugout, that's Tommy Craig in the light blue sweater. He's the trainer. He's going up the runway to the clubhouse with Jimmy Key. Don't know if that's for some kind of treatment or he's out of the game. Ricky Henderson with a nice running catch. You know, we, you forget because Ricky can be so dominant with his running game how much ground he covers in left field. Remember when he played center field in Yankee Stadium? Look at Ricky. Is he enjoying this sure. or what? The fans are taunting him, and he just beams back at them. They did the same thing to Maury Wills, and I guess to Lou Brock. Although Maury and Lou weren't quite the showman that 
quickly, so he brings some of it on himself. And welcomes it. Oh, yeah. Quickly, 0-2 to McGriff. He was robbed of a hit on a tremendous play from the edge of the outfield by Tony Phillips in the first, and then he got a key base hit, a sharp line drive to right in the four-run fourth. A bouncing ball beyond Davis, but right there is Gallego. Had him played perfectly, and it's the second out. About the last month, a lot of teams were putting a full shift on Freddie McGriff. Third baseman over to shortstop, but with Storm Davis fastball, looks very crisp today and able to keep it away. Gallego didn't go to the first base side, and the defensive alignment worked. Todd Burns has been throwing for the A's. Jim Acker was up before for Toronto. Here's Bell. And a ball down low. It would appear to be just a matter of time before somebody hits Renatia because when Mookie Wilson, Wilson hit that ball with a little slap almost to the fence to Ricky Henderson in left field opposite way. You may have called it. Ricky turning. Got him on a fist. Nope. Open. It's carrying though. Just to the edge of the track. And we're back after these messages from your local station. Game three of the American League Championship Series is brought to you by Mazda Cars and Trucks. Mazda, it just feels right. And by Head and Shoulders, because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. The ninth slot due as we start the seventh, that would be Gallego. But for the first time in the series, we're going to see the left-handed hitting veteran, Ken Phelps, who had so many productive years with the Seattle Mariners, then was shipped off to the Yankees. He hit all three of those pinch hit home runs for New York, didn't connect after coming over late in the year to Oakland. Jim Acker is in the game. Jimmy Key is finished. One of those pinch hit home runs beat the Blue Jays and Dwayne Ward. Acker, third ball game he's in. Perhaps the one stat that doesn't show there is hit batsman. He hit Ricky Henderson. Ricky Henderson slid to Luriano and some runs scored. Very important play. Ken Phelps, although he's always been a platoon player, and now reduced really to pinch hitting duty, so he never got the necessary number of at-bats to be among the league home run leaders in raw totals. He has frequently led the American League in home run frequency, home runs per time at bat. It's this one to right center field. Mosby isn't going to get it. It's one bounce against the padding. Lloyd Bear hands it, pegs it to second, and Phelps is in with a pinch hit double. The mentality of the pinch hitters that can do it time and time and time again, like Phelps does, always amazes me. He can do it so often because he waits up until two strikes until he gets his pitch. And he loves the ball down. He got something that looked like it was down and in on him. And now a logical move by Tony La Russa. Yeah, with Walt Weiss on. comes in to run for Phelps, who's congratulated by his mates. And so Weiss will stay in and play short for Gallego, the guy Phelps hit for. A reminder, we'll present our State Farm Rules of the Game feature during the seventh inning stretch timeout. And game four, these same two clubs back here, one Eastern time tomorrow afternoon. And then tomorrow night, we hope that Vin Scully has wrapped a scarf around his neck. Hasn't tested the voice too severely in the last 24 hours. He should be ready to go with Tom Seaver. Rick Sutcliffe for the Cubs, Mike Lacoste for the Giants. Series tied at one. Game three at Candlestick. Once again, the infield in at the corners with the Blue Jays leading by a run and a runner on second base. Freddie McGriff just moved back a couple strides. I think Ricky's going to be hacking. He... In there, one and one. Trying to get through an inning, perhaps from Acker, so they can go to this man, Tom Hankey. But it appears in the situation the Blue Jays are in, if Acker can't do it, Hankey will come in in the seventh. Very early for him. Ricky rolls it to Gruber. 
He looks the runner back. They don't advance him. One down. What a pitch by Jim Acker. You could hear the bat break as Ricky Henderson was going to try it inside and out the ball the opposite way. What Henderson wanted to do if he was going to make it out was to make it to the right side. Either deep in the air to right or on the ground. And the sinker ball just keeps following him. And by steering it between the white lines, he jams himself. A big pitch by Jim Acker. So after he had reached base eight straight times, they've now retired Ricky twice in a row. They haven't gotten Lansford out tonight. A walk and two singles. He has an RBI. He takes inside. Wade Boggs' predecessor at third base, John McLaren, setting the defense. Moving Mosby way over. And now Gruber two more steps off the line, but Mosby was in dead center field. He moves him slightly to right center field. The 1-0 pitch. He lays off. With Lansford at third, Boggs was in the minor leagues, hitting 300 every year, and didn't get to the majors until he was in his mid-20s, and even then they thought about making him a first baseman. Then they swung the deal that sent Lansford away from Boston and opened up third base for Boggs, who won five batting titles in six years. Gruber again. Juggles it. Does he have time to recover? Yes. Hardy came up limping a little bit when he left the batter's box. I don't know if he jammed something or pulled something. At one time, Lansford was one of the fastest right-handed hitters down the line. Just popped off the fingers of Kelly Gruber's glove, and Carney Lansford, maybe even earlier this year, might have beaten that out. He runs very well on the artificial surface. Gives an extra step or so. So a hard sinker, Bob, is what Akron features. He's got a good breaking ball, but boy, that sinker just keeps diving and following the right handers inside. It's up to Canseco now in the seventh. He's had singles his last two times up. After flying to right in the first, he had 269 in half a season with 17 homers and 57 RBIs. But those power numbers prorated. Come to around 45 homers and close to 140 or 150 knocked in. He was really productive coming back just after the All Star break. This is if you project it to 613 at bats, his three year average. Because you have to play Conseco so deeply in the outfield, it's hard to throw anybody out, especially with two outs. He's on second base. A strong arm began loves to Junior Felix and right. Ricky Wilson and Mosby can be run on. And Saker spread out. He's a little semi crouched now and he spread his stance out. It's his base hit stance rather than his long ball stance. Look at the crouch. Acker trying to protect a one run lead. And ahead of Canseco one and two. is back at the runner and works to the plate. Breaking ball got it. What a job by Jim Acker. Phelps started with a pinch hit double, but again, second straight inning, they let off with a double and could not get the run home. Here comes rules of the game. We'll show you the defensive changes in a moment. Here's how one resulted. Watch Carney right about now. He pulls something trying to beat that ball on the sinker to, from Acker that went to left field, uh, to third base. So Phillips goes from second to third, Bob. Weiss, of course, stays in the game. Three pinch ran. And Lance Blankenship, somewhat of a jack of all trades, just like Phillips goes into second base. What a blow that be if Cardi Lansford is out for any length of time. They're going to ice it immediately. So the versatile Phillips from second to third. Weiss who pinch ran, stays at short. Blankenship at second, as Tony said. And Davis works into the bottom of the seventh, beyond his usual average. 
Tony Fernandez fouls it back. Because, excuse me, Bob, Tony La Russa has a 10-man staff. He has one less position player to work with. Just five. So he's got Hasse and Javier, the switch hitter left. Down the left field line, Ricky Henderson spreading over. It's off the 328 side. Another extra base hit for Tony Fernandez. Hit a surprisingly long way in the opposite direction by Tony. His second double of the night. I don't know if Tony can believe that the ball carried this far. We saw Mookie hit one to the warning track. And not uncommon on some days in this park where to center field, right center, left center, the ball didn't carry much, but from right and left center down the lines, it carries. And you just saw how much that one carried. Ideal guy hit now, pull hitter. No outs and a man on second base. Rick Honeycutt. He struggled his last outing. Witt pops it up. Let's see if it stays in. Yep, mm. Phillips got a play. Couldn't move him a base. So Ernie, who had singled home, what right now stands as the winning run is last time up, fails to come through this time. And it'll be Gruber against Davis. Most of Ernie Witt's career, he's been able to pull almost any right-hander's fastball. And having been in a slump recently, fastball is up and in, and he got fisted. They're going to walk Gruber? Yep. He's 0 for 9 in the series. Hit into a double play his last time up. But they're going to walk him and take their chances with Matty Lee. will step up there from the left side unless they make a move right here and go to Honeycutt. Well, Honeycutt's a sinker ball pitcher. You turn around Manny Lee to the right side, a more likely double play candidate. However, Manny Lee is a little bit better hitter right-handed than left. Not that he's a bad hitter left-handed. He was around 300 all last year, so Larusa perhaps going to the sinker ball or Honeycutt. Fernandez at second now and Gruber at first are the only runners Toronto has had outside of the four run fourth inning. They'd gone down in order five of the previous six except for the four run explosion. Davis is done. We're coming back. Cito counseling Manny Lee before a big at bat. Honeycutt coming on. One out. Two men on base. Bottom half of the seventh. And the Jays trying to build on a 4-3 lead. You know I was looking at the card with Honeycutt coming in and just one out and Fernandez at second base. Tony LaRusse had a conference with his middle infielders. They know that Kelly Gruber wants to get a big jump to break up the double play at second base. Do you think they have a trick play with a pickoff, Honeycutt, and McGuire coming behind him? Who are you, Crest? I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> you who traveled from the Midwest all the way here to see this ball game in the beautiful Sky Dome. Well, my brain is fried. I can't answer questions like this. Well, let's go find out. All right. Then. The middle infielders chat. Phillips came to the mound to talk to Honeycutt. Curveball, sinker ball. He can get to the ground ball, but you can see his only other appearance. He had control problems. And that's the way Larusa works. He wants to get that man back out there as quickly as he can. You see, Honeycutt was so important for him. Fernandez yelling across at Gruber something. Don't know if it said watch the pickoff or not. McGuire creeping in behind him. Blankenship trying to surprise Tony. Gruber is not getting a very big lead. And Mike Squires, the first base coach, who was a member of the Oakland organization last year, is watching Mark McGuire like a hawk. Lee with a bouncing ball through the hole. McLaren will stop Fernandez as Canseco guns it to Steinbach at the plate. The bases are loaded with one out. So the Blue Jays 
who said in Kelly Gruber in his press conference, they've played perfectly. We haven't gotten a break. And you can see McGuire was breaking behind Kelly Gruber to decoy him. And Manny Lee shot it through the right side. And that may have been, or those may have been the words of advice given to him by Cito Gaston, that you alluded to earlier. We showed Cito and Manny Lee. Hit the sinker ball the opposite way. Dale Ford out. Trying to get Steinbach and Honeycutt to break it up. LaRusa positioning his defense. Let's see what the infield's going to do in this situation. Felix the hitter. He is moving Weiss back. That may be a decoy for contact playoff third, and then he's going to creep him in. Now he's sneaking back in. infield in this close especially on turf it almost has to be hit right at you for you to have a play very little chance on a sharply hit ball moving laterally that's foul and as an infielder you're almost forced to come home because the middle infielders aren't anywhere near the bag where you can turn a double play junior Felix speed even from the right side sprinter class and see what it looks like from up top. Felix has struck out and fly to very deep center. One and one the count. Fernandez at third, Gruber at second. And the infield in like this, obviously it's late in the ball game, but LaRusso knows that Hankey's down and he's been pitching so well if Hankey in fact comes out. And he lead the runner at first. One and two to Felix, who hit 258 for the year. He was around 300 after his first couple of months in the lineup. He wound up with nine home runs and 46 RBIs. Celebrated his 22nd birthday on opening day of this series. Renee Latchman, the third base coach, who might be in line for the Cleveland managing job, seated alongside his manager at present, Tony La Russa. The one-two pitch. A liner through the box, base hit. One run home. Gruber stopped. It's five to three. Steps Mosby with the bases loaded. Three career grand slams, one of them this year. 0 for 2 with a walk tonight. Only one hit in the series. And a strike call to him. The infield in. In a two-run game now. With Lloyd Speed, you're forced to play in. You're not going to double him up. There's a lot of holes, and he does hit a lot of balls into the turf on the ground. Gene Nelson. Wilson, a switch hitter next. Then a lefty McGriff. the seven five three Toronto two balls and a strike say about the outfield is playing so shallow in this big ballpark they're cheating and 
they're in the kinds of positions as shallow as they are and swung over toward left field look at the right field line don't expect Mosby to pull but they're in the vulnerable position for one over their head or a gapper of course honey cut the sinker ball pitcher it may be hard to lift off the ground for Lloyd Mosby Honeycutt hasn't retired a man yet in two relief stints in this playoff series. His 2-1 pitch to Lloyd. Three balls and a strike. These fans are squeezing the plate on the better Rick Honeycutt. In two appearances, five straight batters have reached against Honeycutt. A pitch away from making it six. And possibly forcing in the sixth run. He swung at ball four. And he knows it. He's looking down in the strike zone. That's what Honeycutt features. And it's too far down. That baby, the bottom fell out. Lloyd Mosby immediately looks back at the umpire. If this was Don Zimmer in the other league, the runners might be going. You never know. Don't look for it here. They can trot in. Nelson's going to come out. Ricky Wilson coming up to the plate. Once down, 3 0. The Jays now lead 6 3. The A's won both in their playground and did it convincingly. Back here in the Sky Dome, trailing 3 0. The Jays finally stirred in the fourth. They got four runs. They've tacked on two more here in the seventh. Honeycutt just walked in their sixth run of the night. Here comes Gene Nelson. Mookie Wilson to the left side. The infield in once again. The base is still loaded. Only one out. From the stretch, Nelson. Base hit through the right side. Toronto pours it on. McLaren waves Felix in. Canseco's throw. Has him. Oh, what a throw. What a block off by Steinbach. McLaren with the lead. Going to manage or coach aggressively and you don't have a faster guy including Ricky Henderson in these two lineups than Junior Felix so Canseco's throw had to be right there Mookie with the infield end shoots one through the right side Jose more than a slugger look at Steinbach's left foot and shin guard Dale Ford right there make sure he held on to the ball good throw good block good call by Ford and Steinbach shaken just a bit. Score the play 9-2. A single and one RBI for Mookie Wilson to make it 7-3. Lloyd Mosby saying get down. As is Manny Lee, but the ball's there. Give him the left shin guard and pull it away. He hung on. What a throw by Conseco. Got to like that kind of aggressive coaching, though. When your team's down two to nothing, you finally get a lead. You got the fan of the ball game, and McLaren sends it. Definitely the thing to do. Oh yeah. If you make them make a nearly perfect play to get you, yeah. Nelson bluffing to third, looking back, and the fans hollering balk, but of course it isn't. Remember what happened. Early on with Moore, Fernandez got caught when they did twice in a row. You don't get the guy off third, rarely off first, unless it's a guy who might be a base stealer like Mookie. He goes too far, but with McGriff up, he's going to hack. 
Well, Mookie to take any liberties now. You know, Tony Fernandez has excited this crowd as much as anybody. It was his double that drove him two in the fourth. Got the third on the air, and he started this inning off with his double. And he's not usually an emotional player, but when he ran off the field a couple times, he's really gotten into it. And when he got to third on oh, that yeah. double and then advancing on the play at the plate, he was pumping his arms, yeah. exhorting the crowd. Now McGriff lost one to center, but Dave Henderson gets back in time, and that'll do it. However... In the bottom half of the seventh, three more for Toronto. Although the A's have two more turns at bat, and the capability with people like this guy, McGuire, striking quickly, let's just speculate for a moment. If Toronto wins this game, and they lead now 7-3, to three, they've done more than just close the gap to 2-1. to one. They've done it with some verve. They've gotten the crowd into it. They have the veteran Flanagan with a long history of success against Oakland. And some of that might not be pertinent because he's had such a long career and the Oakland roster has changed, but he's 2-0 against them this year. Shut him out. 2-0 complete game victory earlier this year. Flanagan against Welch tomorrow. Packers 2-0 pitch to McGuire. You know, you can see Pat Gillick, the general manager, for a oh, year and a half around here was called Stan Pat derisively because he wasn't making any deals. But he went out and got Mookie and Mazzilli, brought some people up from within who helped him get here, got Jim Acker in Atlanta. There's Mookie and left. And you can see what that speed did. That infield had to stay in through that entire last inning with the speed and the switch hitters coming up one after the other. They couldn't just play back and maybe get a double play, 6-4-3 or 4-6-3. Acker walks McGuire to start the eighth. O.J. Simpson starts us on NFL Live, 12.30 Eastern Time, this Sunday, with a report on the goings-on this week with the Raiders and the first black head coach, Art Shell, in modern NFL history, four early games, and a pair at four Eastern Time later in the day on NBC. Ernie Witt yelling into Cito Gaston whether he wants Freddie McGriff to play behind McGuire or not. And they said, stay right there, hold him on. So he's giving a little bit of a hold to Dave Henderson. McGuire does not have base stealing speed. I think he'd want to cut the gap down a little bit. Showing a bond and taking a strike. He had a double his last time up. He has four hits in the series, including two doubles and a home run. Shallow right field. Junior Felix with the catch. Talking about Pat Gillick, the architect of all the Blue Jay success, and even though they have had their share of frustrations coming up just short of the series in 85, the seven straight losses to let it slip away in 87, overall, this has been a textbook job of taking an expansion team toward not short-term, but long-term success. And now it's topped off by the new home, the Sky Dome, assured three million fans for who knows how long maybe they'll approach four million and Gillick has been the key guy others have contributed in the early stages Bobby Maddock and Roy Hartsfield you can't overlook what Bobby Cox did and even though Jimmy Williams was a disappointment to some as a manager he was a contributor as a coach for Cox and an organization man he was a terrific manager uh, him, he just when they lost that one year won this fall knocked down by Acker he recovers and takes the out at first Jimmy Williams just hired by his old manager, Bobby Cox, the Atlanta Braves. Jimmy Williams coached third for him. I think that's just a stepping stone before Jimmy Williams gets another major league manager's job. And he might be better suited to the National League because he's an aggressive manager, likes to make a lot of moves where they make more moves. We've got a lot of emotions tied up in this ball club, Jimmy Williams. He, the years he was here, a lot of success. And that's why Cito Gaston was so reluctant to take this job. He and Jimmy Williams were as close as any two people could get. Confided in each other. And yet not close in personality. Oh, no. Jimmy much more hyper. And in this situation, Cito, a soothing presence. Parker with a drive to left center field. Back goes Mookie Wilson. And Mookie's got it in front of the 375 sign. An inning opening walk. Third straight inning. The A's got the leadoff man on. Didn't score. 
It's Gene Nelson against George Bell, and these guys have a personal history. Nelson hit Bell with a pitch this spring. When I say this spring, I don't mean spring training. I mean the early part of the regular year. Bell charged the mound. He was suspended two games for the ensuing brawl. Later in the year, Welch hit him with a pitch, too. So it's part of the undercurrent in this series, a ball and a strike. When you look at Bell, he is one of many indications of how shrewd Pat Gillick can be. There's Welch with his hands in the windbreaker. Tomorrow's starter for the A's in game four. Phillies tried to hide George Bell. Wouldn't play him. They saw him in a morning workout. In the Dominican Republic, Epi Guerrero, Alamaki, Pat Gillick was involved, and Gillick said, who's that kid out in right? And he was a skinny kid then, very young, mid or late teens. He said, that's George Bell. Do you like him? He said, what a bat, what an arm, what legs. And George Bell was an outstanding runner at one time. The knee surgery, broken leg. Oh, he's... He was an unprotected player. They took yeah. him for a small sum of cash off the Phillies roster in the late 70s. They did the same thing with Kelly Gruber out of the Cleveland organization. He was with the Charleston Charlies. Manny Lee from the Astros. Henke was a compensation pick after Cliff Johnson, the right-handed hitter, left this organization and signed elsewhere as a free agent. Mauro Gazzo, promising young pitcher. Mauro Gazzo went Kansas City. 4 and 0 for this ball club before he lost that Sunday game, which was meaningless. He's ineligible. Without him, when they were struggling in the starting rotation, who knows if they'd have been there. These are all pickups for virtually sure. nothing. And then several years ago, when the Yankees coveted the reliever Dale Murray, Gillick insisted on a young minor league prospect named Fred McGriff and got him. Establishing those connections in Latin America, especially the Dominican Republic, well, just with Epi Guerrero yeah. leading the way, that's really been the hallmark of the organization. You've got George Bell, Tony Fernandez, Manny and Junior Phoenix from the Dominican in the lineup today. And you've got Nelson Luriano from the Dominican sitting on the bench. Played the first two games. And yes, they did call him Stan Pat Gillick for a while because from the time they acquired Mike Flanagan late in the 1987 season until they dealt Barfield to the Yankees for the left-hander Al Leiter early this year. They had not made a deal in almost two years involving a player at the major league level. Here's a blast Whoa. to deep left. If this stays fair, foul ball. Not much. And even though the run might not have been that important, with the Jays in front 7-3, to three, Bell is looking to bust loose and make a statement of his own. Three and two. He thought it might stay fair, but he hit it so hard it just kept hooking. Didn't miss by much. Hey, maybe the style and did wake the Blue Jays up, huh? Along with their home park and these fans. Another 3-2 pitch. This one's hit to the right side. Conseco racing, losing his cap into foul ground, and it lands in the first row of the seats bouncing off the hands of a spectator and back out onto the field we have not yet heard a report up here as to the severity and they maybe don't know of Carney Lansford's injury Conseco with a lot of foul territory there a lot of chairs flying around the umpire right field Dan Morrison right there event of fan interference Bell leading off last of the eighth to be followed by Fernandez and Witt. And he finally goes down on strikes. George Bell won that at bat against Nelson, didn't he? Had some real good rips. A misunderstood man. The whole DH thing a couple springs ago. Was... He and Jimmy Williams did go at it. But Bell, among all the Blue Jays players, perhaps plays with more injuries, may require shoulder surgery after the season. He had two bad shoulders, a bad knee, bad hand last year. And he plays through all that. He plays very hard. Yeah, he'll mess the ball up in the outfield on occasion. Made a great throw in the first two games from center field. Fernandez with a pair of doubles tonight. Each figured in the scoring. Here's Bell, who just missed getting some personal satisfaction against Nelson, and then eventually fanned. The word on Carney Lansford, pulled left hamstring. How serious? We don't know. No further information yet.
the Blue Jays have eight hits, same number as Oakland, but they got them in two bunches of four. Four hits when they scored four times in the fourth, four more hits in the three-run seven. That's high. On the outside corner to Tony. Three Gene, and two. Gene Nelson, the guy who can be a spot starter for you, although not in this staff this year. Boy, he gives you innings. A great straight change. Sneaky fast. Got him. So two strikeouts for Nelson. Bell swinging and Fernandez looking to start the last half of the eighth. Trailing by four runs, the scheduled hitters for Tony La Russa in the ninth are Tony Phillips, Walt Weiss, in the game now at shortstop and Ricky Henderson back to the top of the order. Tony La Russa is going to make a move. With Witt there, he's going to go to one of the left-handers. He's got two left down there, Kurt Young and Matt Young. We'll find out in a moment. I think it's Matt. We'll see. Watch Canseco covering up his face and smiling because the fans are getting on him from the seats in right. Remember how the Red Sox fans at Fenway hooted and hollered at Darryl Strawberry in the 86 World Series, starting that chant, which has since become a fixture around the National League when the Mets are on the road. Darryl, Darryl. How's sort of the called? same thing. How does that go? Uh, don't make me repeat it. It was weak. Tony La Russa. I grant you it was weak. Tony La Russa got to give Matt Young some work. Get his feet wet. Trading by four runs, but Honeycutt struggling. He may need Matt Young to give him some work. Honeycutt hasn't gotten anybody out yet, so in this situation, he went up. Two outs. He could have finished with Gene Nelson, taking his chances, but he wants to make sure he's got a left hander can come in and set up Eckersley with Honeycutt struggling. With one for three. His one hit broke a three-all tie and gave the Blue Jays a lead they haven't relinquished. His other hit in the series was a home run in game one. One time a very hard thrower up at Seattle. He had the Tommy John operation. Transplant of ligament in the elbow, into the elbow. Now he's got a good breaking ball and he's come up with that fork ball. Will he be there? Or is Acker going to come in? It looks like he's getting ready to finish the game off. Acker did an excellent job. Well, he only pitched one inning, speaking of Hanky the other day, so even though the lead is four and it wouldn't be a save situation, they might want to use him. Young walked off the mound in a funny fashion after unleashing that last pitch. I don't know if he was upset because he missed so much to win three and one or if something was wrong with him. You may find out in this pitch. Ooh. Fair ball. Or is it? No. Nope, foul ball, full Ooh. count. Looks like Matt Young is okay. Tonight on NBC. The Tonight Show, followed by Late Night with David Letterman. If you've been following that, uh, Paul Schaefer and David have a bet on both playoff series. Paul is a native Canadian, so naturally, he's got the Blue Jays, and David's got the A's, and right now, Paul is down about five or six grand. But David Letterman's not hosting that tonight, is he? He's running the Sky Cam up here, isn't he? You love the Sky Dome? Oh, the late night sky cam? Isn't that what that is we've been seeing uh, during this game? Tony, I love it when you're hip. Yeah. <laughs> Not too often, but on occasion, I hook you. Yeah. Just a gullible little fella. <laughs> <laughs> Withdraws draws a walk from Young. Meanwhile, right field littered with trash some of the fans overstepping their bounds and throwing things in the direction of Canseco but it appears to be paper only so Tony La Russa's left-handed pitchers four-man staff continue to try and get somebody out could become important later in the series a series that suddenly has a heartbeat as the Blue Jays appear about to jump back into it at home. Well, you mentioned it earlier, Bob, right in their opening, that they're 20 and 6. The last 26 games played after an awful start in the Sky Dome. But once they got accustomed to it, especially their hitters, who kept hitting balls to center field, they wouldn't go out. And that that six loss they got was Sunday was meaningless. So they've really been hotter than that. And they just feel a confidence in this ballpark. The pitching staff seems to be more comfortable. 
And Cito Gaston has found out that he's got to run a little bit more in this ballpark and even bunt a little bit more. Ruber awaiting a 1-1 pitch. You know, Matt Young is registering on our gun in the vicinity of 93 miles an hour on some of these pitches. Now, here's a guy who missed all of 1988 with reconstructive elbow surgery and until June of this year. And he's throwing very hard. Hard out of the strike zone with a fastball. Fastball upstairs sometimes will be harder. Steinbach trying to get him back within himself. The expression used, 93. You're skeptical. Those yeah, well, guns vary around the yeah, league. Yeah, well, the one we're using, apparently three to five miles per hour faster than the Decatur, which uh, one picks the ball out of the pitcher's hands. I believe that's the jug is what we're using, so it's faster. The other picks it up as it crosses because of friction and all else. It's going to decrease the speed. But that is, I'm surprised he's at 93 on any gun. This is a guy described only a few years ago by Wade Boggs oh, wicked. as his toughest pitcher to face. That slider he had up in Seattle, and that's why the Dodgers got him for a while, and then the elbow went. He walks Gruber. So, Nelson fanned the first two men. LaRusso went to Matt Young, and he walks Witten Gruber back to back. I'll tell you, what you want is, again, if these right-handed starters do falter, and there's some awfully good right-handed starters for the Oakland Athletics, you need that left-hander. And Tony Lewis has not found him yet. And Kurt Young still down there, and he did start during the season, moved into the bullpen, and Tony's losing his cool. Left-hander hadn't gotten out yet. You want to turn the switch hitters around? You want one for Mosby and McGriff? If they can't throw strikes, you can be in trouble over even the seven-game series. Manny Lee, a big plate. chopper. He might beat it out. Blankenship, quick release, and got him. Good play by Lance Blankenship, seeing his first action of the series. On to the ninth. Within the city limits, the population of Montreal is somewhat larger than Toronto, but taking the entire area into consideration, this metropolitan area of about three and a half million is the nation's biggest. I hope I'm accurate on this, but I think there are about six and a half, seven million people within a hundred mile radius of Toronto. And uh, I guess about 24 million people throughout Canada. That'll show you how many people there are in this area and why they have a chance to break the all-time attendance record. And some fans have been cynical in this area because of the Argonauts football team and the hockey team. They've not been successful. So the Blue Jays are getting to be more and more their favorites. 50,268 tonight. 39th consecutive sellout. Largest crowd ever in the Sky Dome. And perhaps the loudest anybody's ever heard them. There were articles on the front page for that Baltimore series urging fans to show a little life they have tonight. They were lifeless after three. As they came up in the fourth, their team was down three nothing and in danger of slipping behind to virtual extinction, three nothing in the series. But then the four run fourth sparked by the double off Fernandez's bat and the emotion he showed. And we've got ourselves a series here, provided Henke can close it out in the ninth. It's not a save situation with a four-run lead. And he's behind Phillips 2-0. Which is unusual for him. He's usually pretty good first pitch, strike, get ahead of hitters. Either the split-fingered fastball or the fastball. But had this been a save situation, Henke hadn't blown one. The May 2nd, after a slow start up until he blew one against Boston late in September. Under Cito Gaston, his ERA is a nearly invincible 0.91. And that's in 80 innings of work. In his last 50 innings for that man, he struck out 74. I mean, he is just blowing people away all around the American League. Using the forkball more than the fastball he used two years ago. And evening the count at two and two. You talk about a guy having a defensive series and also pretty good offensively, but 
Phillips in this ball game has lined out three times. He's hit the ball as hard as he did in the first two games. Lined to right field twice and lined to second base once. Maybe that's what Kelly Gruber is talking about, that they haven't been getting any breaks. He lays off. Splinter. We're in the ninth. Full count to Phillips, leading it off here. You may be able to see from that center field camera, Hakey will put the fork ball in his glove sometimes. That's mostly from the stretch, so he's blocked off here. Going with the fork ball, then change it to the fastball. It's softly to left. Mookie coming in. Folks, tomorrow, following game four between these two clubs, stay tuned for Sports World, the IBF Junior Lightweight title on the line. The champion, Tony the Tiger Lopez, against John John Molina in a rematch of one of last year's most controversial fights. Oh, John John's going to be out there again, huh? That's right. Uh -huh. Molina knocked him down the last time, but Lopez rallied to win. And Bob Trumpy will be calling the blow-by-blow -blow tomorrow with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco. Marv Albert tied up with baseball duties. Blue Jays trying to break a skein of five consecutive league championship series losses. Remember they had Kansas City down three to one? Walt Weiss the hitter. It is not inconceivable. Of course, we don't have crystal balls, but the way Toronto has played, that they can win two out of three and even sweep this. And that's that's way out, of course, with the kind of club that Oakland's got. But they've really played so well in this ballpark. And as you said, Flanagan tomorrow, day game, he's pitched well against them in his career. Out of play. Well, the last time we saw Oakland on the road, about two weeks from the end oh, of the regular Boston. season, they got swept at Fenway and made seven errors in the three games. In Very fairness, though, they then went on to Cleveland. Yep. La Russa threw a team party to loosen the guys up. The lead was down to a couple over Kansas City and California, and they played well in Cleveland and in Minnesota to conclude the trip. And they went on to clinch shortly after that. And Minnesota was one that perhaps Tony La Russa was concerned about because they had swept Toronto with three young pitchers. Got three. Tappany and West had come over from the Mets, the latter two, and they beat the Blue Jays. So he was concerned, but they beat them pretty soundly. Folks, after all these years, I'm sure most yes. of you can recite this like a mantra. This telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball, may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Sounded like the yogi on that. Maharish, the mantra. Oh, boy. That's Hakey. That's just about how awesome he's been over the last couple months. A guy that they were looking to trade earlier in spring training and make Todd Stottlemyre their ender, their closer. I'm going to hear him now. A little bit of a strut taken out of the A's step here. And they were strutting after the Parker homer that gave them the 3-0 lead. That came in the fourth. But in the bottom half, four for Toronto. They go on to take a 7-3 lead to this point. Time called by Dale Ford and time for us to tell you the executive producer of NBC Sports is Terry O'Neill, coordinating producer for baseball, John Filippelli, the producer of tonight's game three, Kenneth Roy Edmondson, the game directed from the Sky Dome by John Gonzalez, replay producers Ricky Diamond and Brian Sheriff, pregame produced by Les Dennis, directed by Doug Graber, technical director Len Stucker, facilities technical director Jim Johnson, the pitch to Ricky. In there for a strike. Our thanks to Steve Horn, assisted by Dave Lombardo in the booth. And the fans here would like to see it even a little sweeter with Ricky up. And I'm sure they'd like the strikeout. Hank would settle for a pop up or ground out. He's been their thorn to this point, their nemesis. Henke's 1-1 pitch. Hit to short. Fernandez. That'll do it. The Blue Jays finally take wing in game three. And look to Mike Flanagan, the veteran, 
to get them even tomorrow, but it won't be easy against Bob Welch. A lovely comeback for Cito Gaston's team from interim manager to the American League Eastern Division champion manager and looking to go further. Well, He's just a wonderful as, man. Just as last night at Wrigley, the Cubs closed it out by retiring Will Clark for the last out, the guy who had been tormenting them. Here, an extra measure of satisfaction is Ricky Henderson was retired his last three times to the plate after reaching eight consecutive times, and he makes the last out. The two former Mets just walking into your picture, Mookie Wilson along with Lee Mazzilli. It's a 2-1 series now, and a word from our sponsors. Game three of the American League Championship Series is brought to you by Extra Gold Draft, the party time beer with a full till taste. By Mitsubishi, bringing you a full line of award-winning automobiles. See them all at your Mitsubishi Motors dealer. By U.S. Navy, you are tomorrow, you are the Navy. And by the First Brands Corporation, makers of Prestone Advanced Formula Antifreeze. Tony Fernandez had a couple of clutch hits, especially the first one tonight. And as much a part of the story as anything, Oakland did not hit in the clutch in game three. They were one for 12 with runners in scoring position. Six of the seven men they left on base overall were in position to score. The Blue Jays come from behind. The team that has scored first in all three games has lost. We're back out here tomorrow afternoon. See you from the Sky Dome. For Tony Kubek, I'm Bob Costas. Good night. The proceeding has been a presentation of NBC Sports.